when things aren't going well, don't just look at yourself, have a look at the system that you're operating in because that will be a huge contributor to what's going wrong. It's not, it's not that there's something wrong with us. Welcome to Stand Out, Get Noticed, the podcast that helps you speak and present with rockstar confidence. I'm Christina Cantors, your host and founder of The C Method Communication Skills Training. For free resources and to subscribe to the show, visit thecmethod.com. Hello there, Rockstar. Welcome to episode 116 of Stand Out, Get Noticed. Christina with you here. We've got a very specific topic for you this week. It's all about how to build your leadership capabilities and your self-confidence at work if you're a woman in a technical profession. And I say technical, but it could also be any profession where there's a lack of diversity or the landscape is particularly harsh and unforgiving for women specifically. So it's a very interesting topic and my guest who is joining me today has a lot of experience and wisdom on the topic. Her name is Jenny Bailey and she actually has a very similar story to me. Now some of you may be surprised to learn that I used to be an architect. Yep, I did six years of architecture school, got my master's, worked at a large company, studied for my architect's registration and became a qualified practicing architect. And it was only then when I realised that such a highly technical profession just wasn't for me. I loved working with people, which meant talking to clients, engaging with my team, giving presentations and so on. I loved doing the stuff that requires interpersonal skills. And during my time as an architect, I saw how important these skills were to your success at work, yet they were severely lacking in my industry peers and no one was teaching these skills. And that's what largely led me to doing what I'm doing now, teaching professionals how to be confident in themselves and communicate better in order to achieve their career goals. And I tell you what, it's so much more rewarding for me than doing architecture. Anyway, my guest, Jenny Bailey, had a similar experience, except her background is in engineering. After realising the technical side of engineering wasn't for her, she moved into more leadership-based roles, holding executive positions at Yarra Valley Water, Rio Tinto and KPMG. Jenny now runs her own coaching and training business, helping women to build leadership and confidence so they can achieve their full potential. And she'll explain a little bit more about why she loves working with women um, in the conversation. You can find out more about Jenny at jennybailey.com.au. I'll also link to how you can contact her in the show notes at thecmethod.com slash Jenny. That's J-E-N-N-Y. In this conversation, we talk about the challenges faced by women in engineering and other technical professions. We talk about the difference between men and women when it comes to leadership and also how to build your confidence and self-belief in a difficult work environment and much more. Now, before we get to that conversation, I just want to give a quick shout out to the Fresh Networking Group for having me speak at their inaugural speed networking event last week. It was on Wednesday. I was sharing with, I think there was about 60 people there, all business owners, how to network effectively. And especially in a speed networking situation, it can, can be quite challenging. The three tips I shared on how to make the networking experience more enjoyable and less stressful were and I call them the three Ps. I know I'm all about the Cs, but I've decided to go with the Ps. Number one, be punchy. So with your elevator pitch, make it short, sharp, punchy. Number two, be present. So really focus on being present with the person you're speaking with. Pretend you're the only two people in the room. And then finally, be passionate. You've got to be passionate about what you're talking about because if you are interested in what you're talking about, then other people will be interested in you and find you interesting. Those are my super quick tips for you this week, the ones that I shared when I was speaking at the networking event last week. Now, if networking is something that you want to improve upon, but you really don't like the thought of it, you find it's a bit icky, you don't know what to say, you get really nervous, or you just find it really stressful, then I recommend that you check out some of the resources I have on networking. I've put together a page on my website that's a compilation of my best networking resources. So if you go to thecmethod.com slash 
network like a boss. That's the C method.com slash network like a boss. That'll take you directly to that page with a bunch of resources there, including a link to download my free elevator pitch template to help you explain what you do with confidence and ease. Check it out if you want to be more confident and have a better time of networking. Okay, time to move on to the conversation I had with Jenny Bailey. Hope you enjoy. I saw you speak at the Toastmasters convention recently and I really connected with your story because you help women in the engineering field become outstanding leaders, which I love. So you're all about leadership and communication and confidence, but it's not something that you have always been doing. So can you give us a quick background of where you came from? I certainly can. So I've got an engineering degree. I trained as an engineer primarily because my mum suggested it might be a good thing to do. Um, I was good at maths and science. So I did an engineering degree, graduated as an engineer, sort of moved more into environmental uh, space and the environmental engineering field. Did an MBA and I worked for a range of firms, one Sinclair Knight Mertz. I worked for Rio Tinto in mining, which was a lot of fun. And then after my MBA, I was working for Yarra Valley Water, which is um, one of Melbourne's water businesses. And I found myself as a general manager there and I found a, a real sweet spot for me in that the organisation was on the ground floor of a massive organisational transformation. And there were two things that I got from my time at Yarra Valley Water. One was an understanding of the importance of organisational culture, how to influence it. And I also got to see the massive differences in what an organisation with good internal relationships and well organised can deliver compared to an organisation where there's low levels of trust. And I also realised that one of the things I love to do is to lead teams of people and how joyful that can be. And I realised that I was actually much more interested in the engineering of the organisation as opposed to the engineering of uh, the pipes and the pumps. Um, So after having a, a baby, I had a baby late at the age of 40, I set up my own business really focused on supporting engineers and particularly female engineers. I've got a strong belief that female engineers are extremely valuable um, and I'm happy to share my, my thinking around that in a minute. But what I what I totally love to do is coach other people and to see people grow in confidence, enjoy their work more and the opportunity for me to help them and build the relationship, the intimacy of the relationship as I do that is um, it's just extraordinary and a, and a huge privilege. It must have been an interesting time for you when you were going through that period of recognising that perhaps this technical side of the job wasn't for you? What was that like for you at the time? Yeah, look, I I think that I actually struggled early in my career, um, primarily because most graduate engineers get put into doing detailed design work, um, which is quite sort of an introverted, lonely type of space. Um, And I struggled with that from day one. It wasn't that I couldn't do the work. It was just that I wasn't getting enough interaction with other people as I went through the process. And uh, when I finally discovered the Myers-Briggs type methodology, that was a huge eye-opener for me, um, primarily because I realised that a classic engineering um, type is, is very much an introverted, detailed focus Um, for those who know the Myers-Briggs and ISTJ. And I was not one of those. I was an ENTJ, which is an extroverted, big picture type thinker. So the the most enjoyable part of my my traditional straight engineering work was actually doing big picture feasibility studies as opposed to detail engineering work, Mm. which I really enjoyed. But early on doing the the detail, I found extremely, um, (laughs) extremely challenging. Yeah, that's what I found in architecture as well. And I I soon discovered after working for a few years that the actual client facing part of the role, we are going out there and talking to people and working out what their needs are. That's the bit that I really enjoyed. Not so much going back and drafting up 
where the toilet rolls are going yeah. and the door <laughs> handles are going. That yes. just absolutely killed me. Yes. So, look, it, our stories are identical in that in that facet and I think it's actually uh, not unusual for women and I think that it's the science is clear men's brains and women's brains are different and women tend to have a more relationship social orientation than men do um, which is why so many female engineers really early on in their career find themselves doing the project management or the stakeholder holder stuff and a lot more of the men, obviously I'm talking in mass generalities, mm. but a lot more of the men are happy sitting at their desks um, doing the detailed the mm. detailed work. So why is it that you're drawn particularly to helping women? I guess, well, you know, two reasons. One is I am one. And I think that the experience of women in the engineering space is quite uh, quite unique, is bad language, but it is 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 unusual and the engineering area is extremely male dominated um, and full of great people. I love working with engineers, but it's extremely draining for women um, working in that environment as their career progresses over decades. So when you first graduate and you're a female engineer, it's sort of fun, sort of nice to be a bit different. Um, But as you progress, there's a series of micro frustrations, micro disappointments. For some people, they experience uh, quite overt um, bias against them. And it's, it's a tough gig. And these women are incredibly capable women. They've got amazing analytical, technical skills uh, combined with, a, with the social orientation and the relationship skills it requires to get things done. Um, they're often lonely and isolated. There aren't many other women. And certainly lots of organisations, like if you look at a classic energy utility, for example, you'll find plenty of women in there, but they're all in finance or HR or as assistants. You will find a, a some female engineers, but very small number. And and they're, they're basically isolated and I think they need nurturing and I know the word nurture doesn't necessarily match with the engineering uh, sector but these women need support and they're incredibly valuable they they could add enormous value to the sector um, by leveraging their leadership skills Um, Mm. and it doesn't take much to see that those skills are not being leveraged because you don't need to look at many pictures of executive teams for the big engineering organizations to realize there aren't any women there and if they there are they will generally be the director of hr and they won't be a female um and they won't be in the you know the key role the key project delivery roles i love that distinction you made earlier about the difference between men and women and how women have this really great relationship side to them that they can really utilize to manage teams. So can we just dive a little bit deeper into that for a moment? For women who are in technical industries or in engineering, how can they start to demonstrate this value that they have in order to achieve more or or achieve more of what it is that they want to do? Mm. Look, that is a great question. I think that in the engineering sector, firstly, most people forget that organisations are social units. In, In many senses, they're similar to a family. A family is a social unit as well. And the quality and the performance of that organisation is directly proportional to the quality of relationships and collaboration within that social unit. Um, and I think that in the engineering organisations, there's this incredible focus on the technology, um, the actual engineering itself, the IT systems, and a real lack of focus on the people. And that's at a real detriment to the sector itself. How women communicate the value of those social skills, I think is actually quite difficult and is actually related to the question of how do women actually influence 
inside their organisations, the lack of diversity and the lack of inclusion inside their organisations. Mm. And I think the reality is when you are the, the minority, whether it's, you know, Aboriginal people in Australia or women in engineering, you're already struggling just to survive and you can't actually solve the problem that you're trying to deal with at the same time. It, that problem actually needs to be solved by others. So I think the the I think it's difficult for women to demonstrate the importance of those of that social social skills. I think I really I've spent a lot of time thinking about how to address this gender and equity and inclusion issue and I think the answer is probably sits with the men and finding the right type of open-minded male that recognizes the value that women can bring and invites them to the table. Yeah, I guess it requires effort and acceptance from from both parties, isn't it? When I was reading Sheryl Sandberg's book, yep. uh, Lean In, you know, she's saying, yes, it's the company and the companies and society's responsibility to make these opportunities more available for women and make it easier, but then women also have to step up and take on these challenges. Look, and, and I think she's right. Um, I've met and spoken to hundreds of female engineers and what I notice is that when a male is offered an opportunity inside a business, they just say yes. When a female is offered an opportunity, they go, oh, not sure, not, you know, and I'll think about it. And that sends a message that they're not keen um and and almost in just saying that up front that that sort of turns off the person who's given them the opportunity makes the person think oh this person isn't interested um and and women are saying not sure for a couple of reasons one is and i think this is probably the most common reason is that their confidence and self-belief is below those of men the research shows that there's a 20% that women undervalue themselves by 20% compared to men. My suspicion is in the male dominated industries, it's even more than that. Um, Because I just hear so many women say, oh, I'm not sure I've, you know, I'm I'm quite ready for that. Now, other, other times they have very good reasons for not wanting to step up. You know, they've got twin two-year-olds at home, Mm -hmm. which is a very good reason to not want to take on um, more stress. The problem is as soon as as soon as you say no once, it's just it's assumed you're not interested and then you don't get asked again. Right. That is so difficult. So the women who you work with, what are the biggest challenges that they face apart from that? You know, is it mostly confidence issues? Look, I, I think I think the two biggest things is that they are operating on an uneven playing field, generally in quite a harsh environment. And I think that the, again, the the sector needs to look at the culture of the sector because it's not just harsh for women, it's harsh for men as well. Mm. Um, And I was talking to um, an engineer recently who had spent three years fly in, fly out and had been working um, as part of the construction of Gina Reinhart's Roy Hill uh, Iron Ore Mine in WA. And she said that while she was there, there were at least two people suicided inside their dongers, which is just horrendous. Yeah. And then she shared a story about her boss who started work at 6 a.m. and finished at 9 a.m., 22 days straight, something like that. And I'm thinking to myself, surely that's illegal apart from anything else. (laughs) But that was accepted and that was part of the culture. And, And that sort of harshness is harsh for men and harsh for women. So I think that's number one problem. And then I think number two problem is, um, is a lack of confidence and that the two are sort of related in that if you're operating in a harsh and un- uneven playing field, it starts to mess with your own head. So, you know, again, I met another woman who works in an electricity utility and she just shared a story about once she'd applied for a promotion and they basically said, oh, look, we don't see you as as being a managerial material. And 10 years later, she's still carrying that around in her head, believing that piece of feedback that she's not managerial material. And, it, you know, it's, it's bullshit and it's one person's piece of data. Um, but I think women tend to take this on and believe it while a man would go, oh, well, you know, 
of course I am and just move on sort of thing. So there's, there's definitely different ways that men and women think that don't necessarily help women. And of course, the challenge is not to just teach women to be just like men, because that A, doesn't work and B, causes more sort of psychological damage, for want of a better word, for people who are trying to spend the whole career pretending to be something that they're not. So women have to find a way of doing leadership in a male dominated environment without just trying to be like men. And, you know, that's, there's not many people that's cracked that combination. So for someone listening, if, you know, if, if we've got some lovely women listening who are maybe not, not, maybe not specifically engineers, but in, in technical fields or they find themselves in an imbalanced workplace, what are some things they can start to do to help to boost themselves up a little bit and, and have that confidence to go for things at work? Yeah. Great question. So the the model I work with when I work with women um, has got three elements, mission, mindset, and mastery. So mission is the piece around making sure that you are actually doing what is the right work for you and that you're leveraging your strengths. Um, and that's really important because when you're on when you're on target, when you're doing what you should be doing, it helps you navigate uh, and cope when things don't go your way. You go, oh, well, that hasn't gone my way, but I'm on the right track and I just keep going. So mm. that's the first element. The second element is mastery around leadership and communication skills. So as a society, I think we are generally pretty poor in communication and relationship skills, which is why we have so much conflict. And we also, I think we under equip our managers a lot when they step into team leadership roles. And so building confidence, confidence is a, is a weird thing. Um, but one of the things that can build confidence is skills and knowing that you can do something. So I think building and developing those communication and relationship skills are critical so that's the mastery piece mm. and then of course then the most um i think the the most important piece and probably the most or the least understood piece is the mindset piece and i'm interested in your perspective on this christina but i think that the probably the main contribution to one's success in life probably comes simply from the way we think about ourselves and the worldviews that we look at life through. And you can actually work on your mindset and build your mindset. But that is one of the hardest pieces to do in that it requires having a really good look at ourselves and mm. understanding our own thinking patterns and then learning to change those thinking patterns. But, oh, absolutely. you know, I mean, you know, have a look at Donald Trump. I mean, when you have 1,000% belief in yourself, then, <laughs> you know, you, you, you make it all the way, but despite everything else, and that's, that's what mm -hmm. he's done. Um, and I think that the the mindset of women can be negatively impacted by working inside an uneven playing field because what's happening externally gets internalized. So how do we re you know how do you reestablish your self belief in the face of being surrounded by an environment that um, is not conducive to you doing your best? Um, mm. It's very you know, if something doesn't go well, you can either blame the environment or blame yourself. And most of us are programmed to blame ourselves. So when things don't go well, because you're working in a tough environment, it's not, you know, it's very easy to fall into the trap of there must be something wrong with me. And basically, everybody in the world is walking around with some sort of version of there's something wrong with me. And those sort of setbacks play straight into that. So you know, one practical thing is when when things aren't going well or something's gone wrong, don't just look at yourself, have a look at the system that you're operating in because that will be a huge contributor to what's going wrong. It's not, it's not that there's something mm. wrong with us. 
Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes you need to dissociate yourself from it yeah. and go and go, okay, this isn't just about me. That's that's exactly right. And of course it's incredibly difficult when you're in it. It's easy to see other people in it and point it out to them, but when you're in it, it's hard. And like you said before, when you're in a a workplace where there is an imbalance of genders or whatever, you you have that warped mindset already or that yep. warped perception of what is normal and what's not normal. Yep. I think it would be so valuable to then seek advice or hang around with people outside that industry just to get get some normality back into your life. Look, that's exactly right. And it it makes me think immediately of my time um, when I was at Yarra Valley Water, I was part of the executive team. Um, They were all but one would have been 15 years older than me. All but one was female and she was the HR manager. And every time I was with that group, either in a uh, management, or, you know, executive team meeting or on an executive retreat or on the Christmas dinner with the with the board, I was constantly feeling like I was weird because I just wasn't surrounded by people who really shared the sort of interests and the and the values that that I shared. And so you're hundred percent right. You've got to hang around with people who go, yeah, I do get why you would, you know, why you do that. I mean, just a simple example. I love to go camping, and um, you know, I remember my boss saying, you know, so why would you want to do that, Jenny? You know, so for him, never camped, never understood it, thought I was crazy, which is le- perfectly legitimate <laughs> thing <laughs> to believe. But when you're yeah. surrounded by everybody who thinks that, you know, it just feeds into into gosh maybe I'm a bit weird <laughs> <laughs> now that that's why I love going to conferences because you go for a specific you know for a topic or whatever and you can just geek out about that topic with all those other people mm-hmm. meanwhile your friends at home are going I don't even know what you're talking about yes what's a, what's a podcast <laughs> but, you know, if I go to a podcast conference it's like what mic do you use oh have you interviewed this person oh who are you hosting with and it's just we just geek out about all that stuff yeah I think for anyone listening, you know, find events where you can hang out with people who are like you. Uh, actually, the League of Extraordinary Women is a fantastic network okay. for for women who are entrepreneurs but also intrapreneurs, yeah. a new word I've learned recently. Yeah, they do amazing things. So it's, it's always great to get that perspective and realise that you are not alone yeah. and that pretty much everyone feels the same way that you do. Yes, that's exactly right. That's exactly love right. It. Yeah, I love it. Thank you for that reference. I'll look them up. <laughs> now, Jenny, you have written a book. I have. That's very exciting. It is very exciting. I think writing a book is reasonably, well, it's actually not that hard. It looks hard, but it's not. But there is one part that's extraordinarily hard, which ties straight back into our conversation about mindset. And that is, I've just written what I think is it bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Is anybody going to read this and go, what a load of rubbish or what she on? So that manuscript, for example, sat on my desk for six months while Mm. I was too scared to open it to see what I might have there and to see whether it was rubbish or not. So I gave a, a draft copy to a friend of mine who's a female engineer and when I got an email back from her, to say, I love it and I found this useful and it's going to be one of my reference books. I can't tell you how gratifying that was. So it's, you know, writing a book is all about um, just managing your mindset and managing your confidence, the mechanics. And managing your time. <laughs> and managing your time. Well, even even that's remarkably easy. So um, I've, you know, you learn just like you with your podcasting, you learn a few tips. I've got a little piece of software which enables me to write um you know I can write for 20 minutes even if that's all I have to write I can just write for 20 minutes without thinking I need to take three months off to write a book or even two weeks solid to write a book you can write a book in the gaps between appointments fantastic and stuff like that so. <laughs> well congratulations it's a great accomplishment and it's called women in hard hats building leadership, confidence and life satisfaction in the engineering sector. So I'm assuming that's for women in engineering? It is for women in engineering. Um, Certainly the the same person who just reviewed that book seemed to think it would be valuable for a lot of women in the technology sector. 
Uh, and I suspect there's a lot of stuff in there that's useful for women in any sector, but um, I certainly have targeted it to, uh, you know, female engineers because it's it's their story that I can obviously really uh, relate to through my own experiences. Absolutely. Well, it sounds like a much needed resource. So when will it be released? Look, um, <laughs> it's with the printer now. So Ooh, I still okay. I can't get my editor to give me an exact date, but it's one of those any time dates. But it is it's all complete and it's just about ready to go. Well, I'll send people to your website anyway. Wonderful. To make sure maybe they can grab an advanced copy. Yep. I've got a link there. Um, is it jennybailey.com.au? Correct. J-E-N-N-Y-B-A-I-L-E-Y. Um, and my email is jenny at jennybailey.com.au. And I'm just continually researching and understanding the experiences of women in the engineering and technology sector. So if anyone would like to call me up and simply share their story, I would absolutely love to hear it. So uh, please do. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jenny. Absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. Really appreciate the opportunity to share my thoughts. Thank you so much to Jenny Bailey for being such a fabulous guest on the show this week. You can find out more about what she does at her website, jennybailey.com.au, or simply visit the show notes at thecmethod.com slash Jenny. One thing she said about women leaders being quite isolated and feeling lonely in their careers, that, that really resonated with me. And I mean, I'm a big believer in surrounding yourself with great people and hanging out with those who are going to support you and lift you up and make you feel that you're not alone in this. So I think it's really wonderful that Jenny suggests to go out and find those people that understand you. And I know she also provides a support network of her own with her own coaching, as do I with my group coaching as well. I mean, that's why I do it. So I really loved that she shared that. Okay. And that brings us to the end of this episode. Oh, remember, if you want to be better at networking and not be awkward and be less stressed, go to my page of resources at thecmethod.com slash network like a boss. That's thecmethod.com slash network like a boss. I've got a bunch of resources there for you, including my free elevator pitch template, which will be super helpful if you have no idea where to start when it comes to talking about yourself. Okay, and that's all from me this week. Thank you so much for spending some time with me today and hanging out. Keep on being awesome. I'll talk to you next week. My name's Christina Cantors, and this has been Stand Out, Get Noticed. Okay, I have a ukulele song for you this week. For those of you who are new to the podcast, I like to demonstrate that, you know, learning a new skill takes time. For example, you can't be an amazing public speaker or networker or whatever overnight. It takes time. You've got to work on it. And for me, I've been learning the ukulele from scratch and sort of documenting it on this podcast and showing you that, hey, I'm not amazing at everything that I start to do. It takes work as well. So this is my little demonstration of that. Today, I'm going to play for you a song that was requested by listener Joel, and it is You Are My Sunshine. My sunshine, my only sunshine, you make me happy when skies are gray. You'll never know, dear, how much I love you. Please don't take my sunshine away. The other night, dear, as I lay sleeping, I dreamed.
shrimp died, held you in my arms. But when I woke, dear, I was mistaken. Then I hung my head and cried. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. You'll never know, dear, how much I love you. Please don't take my sunshine away please don't take my sunshine away please don't take my sunshine away <laughs>